So this is going to be a controversial one, not just because of the political issues. When you're dealing with anything related to Jewish history or the Jews in general, there's not really a middle ground per se. People tend to either be anti-Semitic or philo-Semitic. There, there's not really a middle ground here. But I'm going to try and be as just kind of political science-y as possible and just kind of describe it as a story and kind of the political factors that led to various portions of it. So obviously kind of the, the biggest thing about Israel in modern politics, or I guess more kind of in modern culture maybe, is it has very strong millenarian overtones to it. Now what millenarianism is, and I use this term a lot, is the idea that the apocalypse is at hand, that the last judgment is going to happen and the world is going to end. It, it comes from the whole Christ, the term comes from Christ's mil millennial kingdom that will be established at the end of the world or whatever. The Revelations is very vague and complicated and who knows what that actually refers to. But anyway, so that's where millenarian comes from, Christ's millennial kingdom. But it's not just a Christian thing. There's millenarian Judaism. There's millenarian, I guess, Islam. It's, it's fairly common. Shiism, I think, in particular has a lot of it. ISIS has millenarian connotations. It, it also exists in various cults are extremely popular for that reason. The end is at hand. The Messiah is coming back. Jesus is going to return. The Jewish Messiah is going to come etc etc so it was kind of viewed for a long time and it's kind of i guess indirectly implied in revelations depending on how you read it that the reestablishment of israel was a necessary condition for the end of the world for the last judgment so when israel was refounded it kind of sent a shock through the entire religious world and even just in secular terms it is bizarre you have a kingdom that hadn't existed, or sorry, a, a state that hadn't existed for nearly 2,000 years. Actually, I guess it depends how you define it. Because um, Rome didn't annex them immediately. It was a client kingdom. But we'll say 2,000 years just for argument's sake. So the kingdom of Israel, or however you want to call it, hadn't existed since the Romans had annexed it in the first century BC. So you have this state that hadn't existed for 2,000 years just coming back into existence fairly suddenly. I mean, it was a 50-year period or so that Zionism really got going, but compared to the 2,000 years before it and kind of the lamentations of next year in Israel, suddenly it was next year in Israel. And it just kind of showed up. And I don't know if there's a precedent for this anywhere in, in world history of something being reestablished over after such a long period of time. I guess you could say some places like Egypt were under the occupation of foreign powers, but there was periodically an independent or semi-independent Egyptian state. There was no real Israel per se, until the modern day. So it, it is very strange, and it, it's kind of fascinating from that perspective. So that's kind of the intro, so let's get into Zionism. So Zionism is simply put, it's, it's something I think a lot of people have different views on. Zionism kind of at its most basic level is Jewish nationalism, particularly with regards to the establishment of a state in Israel. Um, it was basically the idea that the Jews had to move back to Israel and establish a state there. Now, people have different views of, of what it means. Some people see it as kind of an international conspiracy to support Israel by kind of influencing Western governments. Other people have different views. Some people kind of take the minimalist view that it's simply Jewish nationalism in the same way as American or Spanish or French nationalism or whatever. Some people believe Zionism only applies to Ashkenazi Jews. Some people think it excludes Ethiopian Jews. There's a lot of different opinions as to what its kind of goals are. <coughs> and the Jews themselves really had no idea what 
the goals were, at least to start off with. So you have Theodore Herzl who just said, okay, we need to we need to reestablish Zion. We need to come back and reestablish Israel. But there was a number of different ways to view it. And I'll go through the three largest ones that became the three kind of main political factions in modern Israel. Labor Zionism, Revisionist Zionism, and, and sorry, Labor Zionism, <laughs> Revisionist Zionism, and Religious Zionism. Sorry, Revisionist and Religious kind of sound similar. But you had all these, and then you had like sub factions within these sub factions. Like there is a religious wing of the labor sub faction. The revisionist wing, despite being secular, still had a lot of religious Jews in it. It was kind of a mess, and you had constant breakdowns of people forming splitter organizations, splinter organizations forming splinter organizations. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was a mess. So basically you had Zionism in general and it, it immediately split into a couple major groups. So kind of the first Zionism we saw was labor Zionism or socialist Zionism. So it is basically left-wing Zionism. So there was kind of two main perspectives, the revisionist and the labor, or also known as practical and political Zionism. The left or the practical Zionists saw that a Jewish state would eventually come about if the Jews all moved back to Israel independently and resettled the land, particularly started to create a socialist state there. Local socialism would eventually grow into a larger state. So they, they tried to advocate just individuals kind of moving there, peacefully settling, and eventually creating a socialist society. Kind of another aspect of this, although this would eventually become inverted, was the idea by the formation of a Jewish working class, the Jews would form a more organic society. It wouldn't be where basically the entire occupation worked in white-collar jobs, and particularly high-income, resented white-collar jobs like doctors, lawyers, bankers, merchants, all that kind of thing. And yeah, you would also have a, you would have a Jewish working class and it, they would kind of become a normal people again. That was kind of, it depends on the version of Zionism, but there was a strong undercurrent between various groups, at least at the beginning, was that the goal was for the Jews to become a normal people again. Not kind of to be an international group of wanderers, but to go back to it. So I, I think that's, that's kind of an interesting perspective of it. So the Israeli Zionists would, sorry, the labor Zionists would eventually found Mapai, which today is the Labor Party. They're the same thing. Mapai just changed its name and I think merged with a couple smaller parties to found the Labor Party. And they governed Israel for the first half of its existence. Israel was overwhelmingly left wing. Under their leadership, Israel made a lot of military gains, but the economy was a complete disaster. They ha they obviously brought in socialist economics. They pursued the kibbutz, which only survived with massive government subsidies. Israel was even more to today, just dependent upon the international community giving the money to keep a socialist economy going. So they were also initially very pro-Soviet Union, and we'll get to that in a minute. But all these things kind of changed over time. Kind of one of the irony is, despite being the party of the working class, in truth, the working class, as in, in most Western countries, if you count Israel as a Western country, votes right-wing today. Because the left tends to be more in favor of globalization, and ironically, the free market, than the right does. So the Labour Party is overwhelmingly dominated by Ashkenazi Jews, whereas Sephardic Jews vote for the right. So, and Sephardic Jews are the working class, and some people would argue second-class citizens in Israel. So you have this situation where you have the limousine liberals or the Marseille Marxists who have the support of the upper middle class and the, the privileged, I guess you could say, ethnic group, whereas the, the dispossessed ethnic group and the lower classes vote for the right, the supposed force of the elites. Yeah, here it even says here, <clears throat> 
the Israeli Labour Party's predecessors have been associated with Israeli societies representing the ruling class and political elite, whereas working class Israelis have voted for Likud. So, yeah, that, that's basically kind of what happened. Today, the Labour Zionism is, is in favor of a two-state solution and is once again more in favor of globalism. I read a bi biography about Begin and about the aftermath of the Six-Day War, and it's interesting because the Israeli right make a, a lot of the same, at least today, complaints about the Israeli left that people in Western countries make about the Jews in general. They call them rootless cosmopolitans, traitors to the Israeli ethno state, things like that. They they view them as wanting to kind of blend Israel out of existence, which I find kind of interesting that those those issues also exist there. So, yeah, that is the labor Zionism. And this is Mapai, which was the first um, the first uh, left socialist party in Israel's history. And I think you can notice something very obvious about this. That that's obviously a hammer and sickle with the weed on it. Because initially, Israel was pro-Soviet Union. And we'll get to that once I start going into the, ex the actual history of it. But they viewed themselves as, to a certain extent, building a Jewish socialist state as the first stepping stone of a global socialist society. It's, it's really weird, particularly with the Soviet Union and how they, they switched to the Arab states very soon afterwards. The Middle East is, is very much a place where there's just been a lot of proxy wars. What's that? Okay, that's another left-wing party. So now we have revisionist Zionism. So revisionist Zionism today is the Likud party. And I think most people know what that is. Bibi Netanyahu is the head of the Likud party. And Likud was born out of revisionist Zionism. Now, revision comes from it was a revision of the practical Zion, and they viewed the first goal was the establishment of a Jewish state, and then Jews would just naturally come back there. So once they had a Jewish state, they could have open immigration from Jewish peoples, etc. So their goal was to try to get a great power, be it the Soviet Union, America or Britain, particularly Britain, to establish a Jewish state, and then they could carry out the rest of their campaign. So they're often identified with, I guess you could say, the secular right in Israel, the, the non-religious right. Now, the thing to understand is, much as with Muslim countries, secularism means something a bit different in Israel. Well, it certainly does refer to atheism and anti-religious sentiments, Secularism in Israel, it, well, it, it also refers to religious people who don't think the Torah should be the law of the land. Because in Muslim countries, very often so-called secular governments will still have Islam as their state religion. The, relig the leaders will still often be devout Muslims. They just don't believe that the Quran should be the law, of, should be the constitution, and Sharia should be law of the land. They want kind of a more modern, I guess you could say common law or civil law inspired legal code. But even in some countries that are overwhelmingly Muslim, you still have secular political parties. Like I think that the Pakistani Muslim League is kind of an Islamic democratic party and it doesn't want Sharia to be the rule of the land. So I guess you could call it secular. You also had Nasser, for instance, was a, a, a practicing Muslim and so was, what's his name, Sadat, but they were considered secular politicians because they, they viewed kind of socialism and nationalism as being more of the goals of the state than having the Islamist society. So it's kind of like that in Israel where you have religious Jews like Begin who are still viewed as being political secularists because they reject the idea of having Israel as a theocracy more or less. So I hope that kind of makes sense. So eventually what, what kind of happened with labor's with revisionist Zionism is they started to try to move on mass to Israel. After the whole... Belfort Declaration happened, and it was clear that the British were stalling for time and weren't immediately going to create a Jewish state. They formed Irgun, or the National Military Organization for the State of Israel, for the Land of Israel, and they began to 
conduct terrorist attacks and guerrilla attacks against the British forces. Their idea was if they were able to overthrow, sorry, make it unpleasant enough for the British, they would abandon what was a very poor and strategically largely unimportant piece of territory. Well, I guess it was strategically somewhat important, but they didn't own the Suez Canal. But anyways, they figured if they pissed off the British enough and it became expensive enough to maintain it, the British would just leave and leave a Jewish state behind in kind of an environment where they could pursue their goals. So that happened throughout the first half of the existence of Israel. Revisionist Zionism didn't really have that much of a sway over the country. They were always second or third place in elections. And this was to a large extent just because Israel was more naturally left wing. Also, it was because they just had an unrealistic, I guess you could just say, excessive ideology. Because revisionist Zionism was also, they wanted to take all of Jordan, all of modern Israel, and possibly take Sinai and a bunch of other, other stuff. So they, they had kind of unrealistic goals that the rest of the Jewish community didn't really share because they just thought it wasn't going to happen. And it would result in annexing huge amounts of territory and make the Israelis a minority within their own state. And then they would have to resort to either genocide or expulsions of like all of Jordan, which just wasn't going to happen in order to carry out their plans. So eventually they just kind of became a more traditional nationalist movement. And once there was kind of a reformation under Begin, they no longer questioned the existence of, of Jordan, and they kind of settled on maintaining Israel's modern borders and taking a hawkish policy on identitarian issues, etc. So next we have religious Zionism. So religious, religious Zionism is kind of the most nebulous of the three. Now, religious Zionism is pretty obvious from the title. It's the idea of moving back to Zion and reestablishing Israel on religious grounds. Now, there was kind of a mixture. There were some who wanted to create a, a state first, kind of like the revision of Zionists. I believe that practical Zionism was a bit more popular, and the idea was that they were going to just move there on their own. There was a number of religious Zionists who were very skeptical about Israel's creation in general. And the reason for that was they, they viewed it as being a form of blasphemy as they thought that God would reestablish Israel when the apocalypse started. And that to do that would be, to do it themselves by secular means would be the, would be kind of spitting in God's eye, I guess you could say. So... There was that. They also didn't really like the fact that it was mainly based on ethnic nationalism and that labor Zionism was more or less a a secular, if not atheistic, movement. It was it was rather like I said, it was either you could say secular and kind of how we normally understand it as just being completely non religious, or was outright kind of fedora tipping sort of thing. So they kind of changed over time. For the first half of Israel's existence, they were in coalition with the Labour Party. But after the Six-Day War, which we'll get to, Israel kind of switched gears. Uh, they switched gears on that and they became a lot more right-wing. And today they normally will partner with Likud and the what kind of the heirs to revision is Zionism. So we kind of have these three factions... And it, it kind of depends which part of Israeli history you're at. At the moment, the right's dominant. In the past, there's been periods of left-wing dominance. The religious faction just supports whichever of the two is larger and serves as the kingmaker. To a certain extent, they, they often will kind of take a third position. They'll be very right-wing on social issues, but center-left on economic issues. So they're kind of right down the middle on a lot of these things. So that's kind of the background of Zionism. So those are kind of the different strands. And today we can kind of see in, in terms of the modern political parties, let me just find a, a map of it. Okay, so let's look at a more recent election. So we have 2015. 
So as you can see, we have the main party is Likud. So Likud is obviously a conservative, sort of nationalist, sort of populist right-wing party. Then you have the Zionist Union, which was kind of a mixture of a couple different left-wing parties, including the Labour Party, with the goal of trying to form a united opposition. You have the Arab Party, which is irrelevant. Then you have a bunch of other ones. This one, for I think some reason, partnered with Bebe in exchange for some other stuff. But yeah, you have... Who else is there? You have the religious party. So you have the Jewish home. You have Shaw's. You have another kind of revisionist Zionist party. Uh, let's see here. Israel, our home, which is mainly a Russian one. You have United Torah Judaism. So the, the kind of the coalitions you start to get during this time period. Let me see if there's a, 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 a picture of what the coalition looked like after it was done. It doesn't look like there was one. But yeah, so that was kind of the outcome of the election is you, you had a coalition between, let's see, 34th government of Israel. Yeah, so you have a, a combination of the right and a couple center parties together in forming a coalition. Now, Israel has proportional electoral systems, so no party ever wins in any real sense. Let's see here, Knesset, 20th Knesset. Is it going to show? No, it's not going to show that. Okay, well, I tried, okay, I tried. Okay, here we go, government. Yeah, Likud, we have some other center-right and right-wing parties, and they barely have a majority, and it's almost impossible to get a majority. And, yeah. So that's kind of the background of, of Israel. Those are kind of the main political factions in Israel. What would basically happen, and we'll get to this in a bit, with religious Zionism is after the Six-Day War, the religious Zionists would basically view the Jewish people as being redeemed. And after redemption, they became a lot more right-wing, and they said Israel has received God's blessing because we, we were able to retake Jerusalem. We have at last come home. We have the Wailing Wall, the Temple Mount, all that kind of stuff. And it's time to really get down to business. And they kind of drifted over to the right. The right also kind of moderated and abandoned some of their more extreme positions. And you kind of got into the more modern kind of government. So yeah, religious Zionism today, which is often called neo-Zionism. So it's, it's a basically right-wing nationalist kind of movement that's more places a bigger focus on religious issues than either of the other two main factions. So it took me a while to kind of explain Zionism and its variants. So next episode, we're going to go through the history of Israel. So from the Balfour Declaration to the aftermath of the Six Day War, I could do it here, but the video would be like 60 minutes long. So we're just going to cut it off here and look forward to the next video.